This is the stuff of hope, the core ingredient of a story. A batch of rocket fuel for a missile, an intercontinental ballistic missile. It is solid propellant, the driving force for the Minuteman intercontinental ballistic missile, a major new instrument of this nation's war deterrent power. Its mission is peace. This is the stage for our story report. This is our protagonist, Minuteman, a new muscle in this country's armament of peace-preserving force. How best can we judge its importance? We must judge it in the light of what it was designed to do, and that job is to serve as an integral element, the newest essential deterrent in our combined arsenal of deterrent weapons. Men and bombers of the Strategic Air Command, armed and ready around the globe. They patrol the peace along the edges of aerospace. In team with our bomber strength, the Air Force missiles. pledged to a single purpose, defense, to ensure that any breach of the world's delicate peace will be committed only at a cost no civilized, sane government could countenance. They are masterworks of our scientists and engineers and of Air Force planning, research and development. But they are more. They prove the need for a new generation of missiles, simpler missile systems of high reliability, ICBMs that could be produced at a cost and pace that no potential enemy can match. They proved the need and provided much of the technological experience and momentum for fast development of the Minuteman missile. The simplicity and reliability of small, solid propellant rocket engines had been proved for many years in such air-launched weapons as the Air Force Falcon. You press the button of the firing circuit and let her go. For the long-range missiles, the rocket scientists and engineers had developed large liquid-fueled engines. The liquid propellant engine packs enormous power. It also packs an intricate load of mechanisms, tanks, pumps, piping and controls, all necessary to effective performance. The billion dollar question could be stated quite simply. Could solid propellants be developed and made to work efficiently in engines big enough to propel the ICBMs? Years of study, test and retest produced the answer, but it was not easy. From this small engine to this large one was heartbreaking development, building success on failure, many hundreds of test firings and several million brain hours of labor. But the feasibility of the large, solid propellant rocket engine was proved. Breakthrough one was scientific. Solid propellants were proved sound for propulsion of the big birds, the intercontinental weapons. And beyond the Minuteman engine, technology began to visualize solid propellants producing multi-million pound thrusts for certain phases of interplanetary flight. Breakthrough two was tactical. The Minuteman could be counted on to strike out on the intercontinental mission at speeds approaching the velocity required to put a satellite in orbit and to deliver its persuasive payload accurately on pre-selected targets. Breakthrough three was economic. Minuteman, thanks to its solid propellant engine and simplified construction assembly, 
could be produced in quantity at a fraction of the cost of its ICBM companion weapon systems. To understand its tremendous promise, we must understand it both as a military or weapons concept and as operational weapons. First concept. It had to be, and was designed to be, an instrument of decisive retaliation, a counterforce capable of permanent readiness and instantaneous reaction in the event of attack. Thus, Minuteman, on command, will perform like this. First stage engine provides the liftoff power and drive for the initial phase of the powered run. It is dropped at a precisely predetermined point in flight. The second stage engine drives the bird into its space trajectory. The third stage engine powers the missile through its final guidance run. During the powered phase of the flight, the guidance mechanisms direct the missile on its preset course. To make the most of the nation's best scientific and production resources, the Ballistic Missiles Division called on five of the country's most advanced scientific and technological development centers to bring Minuteman operational fulfillment. They worked concurrently on design, development, and production of the five components that comprise the Minuteman weapon system. As prime developers of solid propellant fuels and engines, Firecall Chemical Corporation is responsible for design and production of the first stage engine and technical backup on the second stage. The second and third stage engines are the responsibility of associate contractors in the project, Aerojet General and Hercules Powder Company. The guidance package, a highly sophisticated instrument that can neither be jammed or diverted by enemy electronics, is the responsibility of the Autonetics Division of North American Aviation. The AFCO Corporation has developed the indestructible re-entry vehicle that protects the ultimate payload. And the Boeing Airplane Company is responsible for final assembly integration and test of the completed missile. The entire project is under direction and surveillance of the Ballistic Missiles Division of the Air Research and Development Command. The Minuteman is possible as concept and as operational weapon, principally, of course, because its engines work at the drop of a hat. Here in the hills above Brigham City, Utah, the finished engine cases roll to propellant charging pits above the expanding industrial complex where techniques in quality control and inspection ensure total built-in reliability for every engine. Reliability protected by deliberate care through every stage of handling. For production efficiency, the engine cases are set in underground pits. the propellant charge flows into the engine around a specially designed core. After the propellant has cured to a solid state, the core is removed. Nozzles are attached and an igniter inserted. From here on, the engine is ready for instant firing. As can be seen from this prototype test vehicle, total design and configuration of the Minuteman missile were planned to capitalize on our most advanced industrial techniques and thus to gain the advantages of low-cost, line production, manufacture of components, and high speed of final assembly. First stage, second stage, third stage, after that, the trajectory is fixed on target. This test missile carries an improvised nose cone for ballast. As an operational weapon system, the Minuteman will perform as an integral element within the total structure of the strategic force. Each small crew will control a large force of ready-to-fly missiles. Each one armed, aimed, and ready. Each or all can be triggered in less than a minute from the moment of command. To ensure and enhance the strike-back power and certainty of the Minuteman system, mobile launchers will prowl the nation's railroad system provide additional security for the missile's retaliatory punch. Mobility enhances by a significant factor the total deterrent value of the Minuteman weapon system. A train such as this model, for example, could be a nest of mobile Minutemen in disguise. Here today, where tomorrow? Only its commander will know.
will-o'-the-wisp targets are unlikely victims of a sneak missile attack. Assembled and ready, the weapons will go by air, road, and rail from support base to assignment. Their deployment planned with precision to ensure maximum invulnerability to attack. Minuteman squadrons will stand guard in underground silos, strategically dispersed and heavily hardened to ensure effective survival in the event of attack. The launchers, in turn, will be under constant, instantaneous firing control from operational control centers, manned by highly trained personnel of the multiple Minuteman squadrons. <laughs> Hidden squadrons of Minutemen will be under constant control from a network of firing bunkers, Air Force manned, and each in turn controlled from a secret central command center. And from command to blast off, a matter of seconds. There then is your Minuteman a strategic weapon concept, and as operational missile. Its effectiveness rooted in the simplicity and reliability of its solid propellant engines. Its deterrent and strike back capability assured by thoroughly proved guidance and re-entry components. Its operational effectiveness made certain by dispersal in hardened silo sites and the roving alert of mobile launching platforms. Its ultimate reliability as a counterforce, a living reality in the trained and dedicated men of the Strategic Air Command. Its mission to preserve the peace through its power to destroy. May history record that it was never fired in anger and that its greatest mission was to help power man's long leap beyond the challenges of armed security into new regions of understanding among men and nations. Meanwhile, the job at hand to mount the new power that must secure the peace. President Eisenhower reassures the nation that Russia's success with the first satellite does not indicate a serious lag in American rocket research. Vanguard, for the reasons indicated, has not had equal priority with that accorded our ballistic missile work. Speed of progress in the satellite project cannot be taken as an index of our progress in ballistic missile work. Our satellite program has never been conducted as a race with other nations. Rather, it has been carefully scheduled as part of the scientific work of the International Geophysical Year. I consider our country's satellite program to be well designed and properly scheduled to achieve the scientific purposes for which it was initiated. We are, therefore, carrying the program forward in keeping with our arrangements with the international scientific community. is the scene of a significant ceremony as President Eisenhower decorates outgoing Defense Secretary Wilson with the Medal of Freedom and thanks him for his service to the nation. 
His successor, Neil McElroy, is sworn in and congratulated by the chief executive, who laughingly comments, now you're a bureaucrat. The Defense Department, with its $39 billion appropriation, is a post demanding one of Washington's top administrators. Cotton is still king in the South, at least in Blytheville, Arkansas, a scene of the 18th annual national cotton picking contest. Nimble-fingered, strong-backed contestants from all over Dixie take part, ranging in age from 12 to 74. Youngsters and oldsters compete in separate classes. Speed alone isn't enough to win. As each picker finishes up, the cotton is spread out for the judge's inspection. Cleanliness counts. The man who gets there fastest with the mostest is Roy Peterson of St. Louis. Victory is worth $1,000. Who wouldn't cotton to that kind of money? Escorted by his gentlemen, when the Duke of Bedford and the Duchess Butler, James Boyd, begins a leave of absence from the ducal service. Supreme among gentlemen's gentlemen, Mr. Boyd visits America, lending his talents to the publicizing of a new production of the classic cinema comedy, My Man Godfrey. Mr. Boyd will attend the winner of a forthcoming nationwide contest as personal butler for a full week. Until then, he'll bottle for June Allison, a surprise birthday gift for the lovely co-star of My Man Godfrey, who gets the good news from producer Ross Hunter. And Boyd is a bird who really can bottle. Nice bit of cake, what? As they say in Piccadilly. Canada pushes back its railroad frontier still further as 300 miles from North Vancouver to Northern British Columbia are opened through the breathtaking wild beauty of Peace River country. Along its route, every challenge known to modern engineering is presented by the rugged terrain. Not the least of these is a series of bridges spanning the many gorges. At one spot, the bridge crosses at a point 280 feet deep. $47 million and 20 years' work have gone into the undertaking, which is opening up a fabulously rich economic empire. A touch of Paris on Fifth Avenue, a jewel boutique where shoppers can just nip in from the street and pick up a Van Cleef in Arpels trinket as a gift. An $800 necklace or some chic matching bracelets, $1,350 each. Ouch. The ring, ruby and diamond, is a steal at $350. A charming ensemble, blue cocktail dress and jewelry worth over a million dollars. Empress Josephine's tiara, diamond marquee pendant, and just a gold leaf bracelet to finish off the ensemble. Chic? Chic. Seventh game of the World Series. Third inning. Bob Hazel on first. Johnny Logan facing Don Larson. Quebec's throw is high and Logan beats the relay to first. The Braves are on the warpath and heap big slugger Eddie Matthews is up. Matthews doubles into the right field corner, and here comes Hazel around the score. The National League champs make it two to nothing as Logan slides in safely. Exit Larson. Enter Bobby Chance to face Hank Aaron, series hitting star. Up the middle, the 11th hit of the series for Hank, driving in Matthews as the battling Braves bring joy to their rooters. Next up is Wes Covington, stellar left fielder. Covington also singles, and a miracle comes closer to reality. There's no tomorrow for New York. Today is for the Braves and Milwaukee. Frank Torrey at bat. On the force at second, Aaron scores, and 61,000 fans in Yankee Stadium see the end in sight. The Braves get a little insurance off Tommy Byrne in the eighth inning. Going, going, gone. A home run for Del Crandall, and the astounding Braves have just about clinched their first World Series. The Yanks were favored, but clutch hitting and stout-hearted pitching turned the tide. Lou Bernadette's name goes on the record books. Three series victories. Base is loaded in the ninth, but Scour and Smash is backhanded by Matthews. He steps on third, and it's all over but the tumult and the shouting. The new world's champions of baseball, the Miracle Men from Milwaukee.